Um, we want to welcome everyone to the telehealth uh, for rural health clinics and learning about best practices. This is part three of a three-part series that our team has put together to really focus on telehealth since telehealth has really grown during COVID and probably will continue to grow even after everything opens back up. Um, really discovered the value of telehealth and so we wanna support you in making your telehealth programs uh, as successful as possible. Our first part was on school-based telehealth our second part was on telehealth um, and just some general um, updates and reimbursement updates and some things going on in Indiana. And Becky Sanders presented that during our critical access hospital convening meeting. Becky's with the Indiana Rural Health Association and Upper Midwest, Midwest Telehealth Resource Center. And so we will make sure that you receive the recording links to those sessions if you're interested in that information too. But today is very focused on clinic-based telehealth. And so I believe we have a very good program pulled together for you. Elizabeth Burroughs has a couple of clinics here in Indiana speaking today. We have with us Dr. Sarah Fleming from Greene County, uh, their rural health clinic and Joyce Geis with Rush Memorials Clinic. So they'll be presenting uh, later on in the program. And we're going to start off um, hearing from Nicole Watkins. Nicole is with the Indiana Rural Health Association and has been with them uh, since fall of 2020. So hopefully you'll get to see her out and about as things begin to open up more. So we want to um, make sure and welcome Nicole to Indiana and presenting for us. Um, Nicole does have a background and has a BS in health administration with a minor in business administration from Indiana State University. She has a master's in public health from Indiana Wesleyan. And she has also worked at the Richard Luger Center in Terre Haute and has really gained a lot of good Indiana knowledge from there. So we're gonna turn the program over to Nicole and she will be sharing her presentation today. If you have any issues with Zoom, Allie Orwig with the Indiana Rural Health Association hosts the Zoom platform. Please chat to her or um, email me and let me know. Um, and we'll, we'll work on getting everything uh, connected. And then, um, also, the presentation for today was sent out on Monday, if you would like to pull that up for reference. So at this time, Nicole, if you'd like to go ahead and share why that will be wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Becky, for that introduction. Um, like Becky said, I'm Nicole Watkins. I am the Rural Health Clinic Network Director with the Indiana Rural Health Association. Um, and just a quick agenda um, for my kind of section of today. Uh, we're just going to cover several topics regarding telehealth and RHCs, um, including types of telehealth visits, an example of a telehealth workflow, um, telehealth reimbursement, ways to market telehealth services, and ways to use telehealth to offer behavioral health services. So we'll start with the different types of visits that are recognized by Medicare, and there are four types of virtual visits. Um, there are telehealth visits, which are real-time audio and video e-visits, which are online E&M visits, virtual check-ins, uh, which can be assessments by telephone or other telecommunication device, just to determine whether an in-office visit is needed for that patient's chief complaint. And then lastly, um, there are telephone E&M visits, which are actually not covered by Medicare, although they recognize them, um, but they may be covered by some different private payers. So although both telehealth and virtual communication services use technology to communicate, they are separate and distinct services. Um, telehealth services are considered a substitute for an in-person visit. So that's why they're paid at the same rate as it would have been as if it had been furnished in person. So with some exceptions, um, telehealth services require the use of interactive audio um, and digital telecommunication systems. Um, so that they just provide real-time communication between the provider at a distant site um, and a beneficiary at an originating site. Remote evaluation services are not a substitute for a visit, um, but actually are used to determine if a visit 
is necessary. So some different telehealth uses, it can be used for virtual visits. So this is via video, telephone, live chat, uh, chat-based interactions can be on online platforms or mobile app communications. They can be used to transmit personal health data, vital signs, other physiologic data or diagnostic images that providers can use for consultation, diagnosis, or creating a treatment plan. And then remote patient monitoring. Um, so this is the collection, transmission, evaluation um, of individual health data from a patient to their healthcare provider. Um, so this can use different technologies such as wireless devices, wearable sensors, implanted health monitors, uh, smartphones, mobile apps, different things like that. So this is super helpful in monitoring um, ongoing conditions and also for chronic disease management. And lastly, we just have physician to physician consultation. So I wanted to throw this slide in here just because um, of course, as you all I'm sure know, um, things have changed during the public health emergency. Um, so currently under the public health emergency, RHCs can be either originating, which is where the patient is located, or distant sites, which is where the physician is located. Um, but after the public health emergency ends, RHCs can once again only be the originating site. So there is um, legislation out that allows RHCs to stay distant sites after the public health emergency. So two of those legislations are here on your screen, HR 7663, which permanently expands distance site provisions for RHCs and also allows for payment for telehealth according to the rate of in-person visits. And then HR 7187 is very similar um, in that it also permanently expands distance site provisions. And then it requires reimbursement for safety net providers through the all-inclusive rate. So I know that the National Association of Rural Health Clinics, um, NARHC, has been in continuous contact with Congress to advocate for the passing of both of these pieces of legislation. Um, so if you hear talk about these different legislations um, or if you have any connections with your local legislators, you can encourage them um, to support these as well. So workflows, um, we'll get into these, um, but of course they'll vary by clinic as there's not a one size fits all approach as you all know as well, but the AMA does give an example of a potential telehealth workflow just by breaking it down into three simple sections, before, during, and after. So before the visit, um, we really need to engage with patients and educate them on telehealth. Uh, I'm sure not many patients were familiar with telehealth, especially before COVID happened. Um, so we just need to educate patients on the offering of telehealth, um, identify patients that are likely to succeed with telehealth, set those expectations for how the visit will go using telehealth, and then just educate on proper appointment standards. Um, certain standards still need to be upheld even when you're using telehealth. We also need to implement scheduling protocols. Um, so just identifying appropriate clinical use cases. So when are we going to use telehealth? Um, determine when and how telehealth visits will fit into the clinic schedule. Updating the EHR scheduler, do we need to identify triage questions for scheduling appointments? Um, we also need to ensure clinicians are only providing care in states where they're licensed um, and also ensuring telehealth is covered in the clinician's liability insurance. So during the visit, we also need to handle patient intake or quote unquote rooming the patients. Um, we also need to support patient and clinician troubleshooting um, technology is great when it works. Um, so just having some background knowledge on ways to troubleshoot different issues is good. Uh, we need to set up exam rooms. Do we have a special room where telehealth is administered that has the camera, the microphone, a computer, a tablet, whatever you may be using? Uh, do we have special rooms set up for that? Or are they normal rooms? Um, and then also we just need to communicate with patients during the visit. Um, some things can be lost through um, just online communication. So just making sure that everything is super clear for the patients is important as well. After the visit, um, we need to know what telehealth codes to use for RHCs. It is different 
Um, we also need to just integrate CPT codes and appropriate modifiers into our EHR. Then we also need to share visit summaries and follow up care instructions um, with the patient and make sure those are in the EHR as well. So as we move into talking about reimbursements um, for telehealth and RECs, we're mainly going to talk about two different HCPCS codes um, that you might have heard of. They're G0, G2025 and G0071. So we'll start with 2025. Um, so on February 23rd of 2021, CMS has updated um, the reimbursement rate for an REC telehealth visit with the G2025 code to be $99.45 for claims on or after January 1st of 2021. Um, so as this was announced in February, um, Max will automatically reprocess claims with G0, which G2025, sorry, um, codes for dates of service on or after January 1 um, that were processed before the rate was updated in the system. So that should happen automatically. Um, the G2025 code is used to bill telehealth preventive services that have waived cost sharing, and you do this using the modifier CS. Cost sharing is waived for COVID testing related services that result in an order for or administration of a COVID test during the public health emergency. The CS modifier distinguishes those telehealth services that don't have cost sharing waived from those that do. So CMS has also modified the CS modifier description um, to account for this additional use. So during the PHE, um, you can build G2025 for audio only telephone e &M services for the CPT codes listed on the screen here, the 99441, 99442, and 99443. Um, and you can see their descriptions on this slide as well. So as of July 1 of 2020, so we're going back a little bit here, um, the CG modifier is no longer required on claims with the G2025 code. We do, however, need to use the place of service code equal to what it would have been had the service been provided in person. And then also use the modifier 95, um, which indicates telehealth. So both of those should be used on our claims when using G2025. So moving on here to G0071, um, Payment for virtual communication services now includes online digital e &M services. Um, those are non-face-to-face -face patient initiated digital communications using a secure patient portal. Um, so the online digital e &M codes that are billable under G0071 are also listed here, uh, the 421, 422, and 423 with their descriptions. Um, so to get payment for those codes or for virtual communication codes, um, G20, 12 and G2010, you have to submit an RHC claim with the G0071 code on it. And CMS will pay a new rate of $23.73 um, for those claims submitted with that code on it. Nicole, this is Becky. And we have a question in chat. And so I yeah. thought we probably should address it right here. Um, the question is, we are located on the Indiana-Ohio border. Can our providers continue to see patients who are actually located or live in Ohio virtually during the public health emergency and after the emergency is lifted? I believe so. I don't have a source for you on that. Um, Chris, I can look that up for you and shoot you an email if that's helpful. I just don't want to give you the wrong answer right now, um, but I believe so. Thank you. All right, no problem. Thank you for bringing that up, Becky. <laughs> All right. So just a note um, on our RHC cost reports, is that RUCs have to report both originating and distant site telehealth costs um, on the form that's listed here, CMS 22217 um, on line 79 of worksheet A. So there's a section titled cost other than RHC services. Um, and there are sources in the bottom left-hand corner if you wanna see where I got this information. Um, I just, that was a very quick snippet in this bulletin. So I wanted to be sure to pull that out um, just so that 
we're not surprised by anything later. So just a quick note on marketing. Um, it's very important to market to your community and just to let them know that your clinic provides telehealth services. Um, so you can market to your community, obviously, in numerous ways. You can use um, a clinic website if one exists. You can use um, a parent hospital website if you are owned by a hospital. You can use social media pages, again, whether that's for your parent hospital or your clinic social media, um, local news outlets, um, TV, newspaper, different outlets like that. You can email patients through portal. Um, if you have a portal, just saying that we are now offering these new services for your convenience. Here's how to set up a telehealth appointment. Um, you can use signs on the clinic doors, use banners outside the clinic. Um, and there are numerous other ways. Um, these are just a few that I had thought of. Um, but yeah, if you can just really get the word out and spread the word, um, you might need to explain what telehealth is, what the process looks like to schedule and what the process looks like during the visit and after the visit, um, just to kind of make patients feel more comfortable and um, increase your accessibility. Also, another quick note on behavioral health. Um, so in addition to sick and well visits, RHCs can also provide behavioral health services via telehealth. So you can use those for numerous things, um, evaluation, diagnosis, case, con case consultation, treatment, medication management, continuing care, provider education, and patient education. Um, so there are lots of ways that we can utilize telehealth, not just for um, sick or well visits. And so just kind of keeping our minds open to all the different possibilities um, that telehealth can bring us. Here's my contact information. Um, like Becky said, she has sent out the slides. Um, so you have my information if you need to get a hold of me or have any questions. Um, and then I also have all the re references and resources here all compiled. Thank you very much, Nicole. At this time, I think we're going to transition. Becky, you were muted if you were talking. I thought I said it was okay. Yeah, I was. No, I was just going to say if anyone wants to unmute their line and ask Nicole any questions or definitely chat in and um, we'll make sure that your questions get addressed. Um, Nicole, one other uh, question that was emailed to me was, um, where is the best place to monitor the legislation that's going on in Indiana? I use the National Association of Rural Health Clinics a lot. They are very, very, very active. Um, Nathan Baugh is their government affairs staff. It's probably not his official title, um, but he is extremely, he's really great. And he's extremely responsive to emails. So if you have specific questions, he's happy to answer those. Um, if you don't know who your legislator is, um, it can be kind of hard to find those. I'm not going to lie. Um, so you can email him and he will send you all the information that you need to contact your legislators. Um, so he is a great resource. Their website's a great resource. You can sign up for their emails and subscri subscribe to their newsletters too. Great. Thank you. Elizabeth, that was all the questions I had. Okay, thanks, Becky. So now we get to learn firsthand from two providers, um, one of which is in an administrative role. So I'm gonna ask Joyce and Sarah to show your faces here so we can see you. And um, I, of course, have some questions prepared and letting them do some, just some talking about their experiences. But again, as always, mm -hmm. if you have questions, unmute your line or you can add it to the chat. So again, Joyce is from Rush Memorial and Sarah is from uh, Greene County's Rural Health Clinic. So Joyce, if you wanna start, do you just wanna tell us about your telehealth experience, what you guys are doing at Rush and your involvement in that? And then sure. we'll ask Sarah to do the same. Sure thing. So um, I'm Joyce Geis. I am the VP of Provider Services here at Rush. I'm also um, a nurse practitioner. I've been a family nurse practitioner for 21 years and so <clears throat> I had a little bit of of ability to help really get 
this telehealth kicked off here at Rush, um, just due to the fact that I'm a provider and had a lot of input that way. So we were able to, we actually had it started before COVID came about. We were pretty, I would say we were almost neck deep in it. We were about, oh, three or four weeks away from going live anyway with telehealth before COVID uh, came about. So then we just pushed things up way faster and ended up, you know, getting it um, accomplished a lot, a lot quicker than, than originally planned. And so that was really, we, we were drinking the, the telehealth Kool-Aid way before that was cool. And so we were excited to be able to utilize something that we were, were hoping was gonna work well uh, for us, you know, during the pandemic as well. Dr. Fleming, you wanna talk about your experience? By the way, if I call her multiple things, I'm not being disrespectful. I've known Sarah since our DePaul days <laughs> and living across the hall in a sorority house. So, and we roomed together during med school and law school. So it's very difficult for me not to call her Batterton or Sarah. So, but I'm trying to be respectful and professional. No worries. No worries. So, Dr. Fleming. Um, so I'm a pediatrician um, who works at, um, with the my clinics through Green County General Hospital, um, and I've been working there a couple. I'm, I think I'm coming up on a couple of years there. Um, I did before the pandemic. I was doing some school telehealth with the program um, here, um, which I thought was a great, uh, great opportunity to offer to the families in the area. Um, you know, it, it worked very well. I know you guys already had a school telehealth thing, it sounds like, so I don't know how pertinent um, this is, but um, I thought that it was um, a really nice, nice service to offer, um, especially for kids who, you know, a lot of what I would see there would be the, well, it was nice because the school nurses were equipped with the physical exam equipment. So they had the otoscope that could then transmit the video and images to me. So I, you know, could feel, confident in um, exam findings and, you know, whether or not it was consistent with an actual ear infection. And the school nurses could also do rapid straps on kids. Um, and so for kind of some of those kind of fairly simple, straightforward things, it was, it worked very well. Um, we haven't really done much school telehealth at all this year, of course, because of the pandemic and um, just logistically, um, what the nurses have been able to do and, you know, you can't really do rapid strips on kids anymore in the nurse's office and just, so that kind of fell off. Um, I'm hoping that'll be, um, a bigger part of my practice going into next year as hopefully, um, we kind of get in a better place as far as where the pandemic is. Um, then in my practice in the clinic, I'm, I'm very part-time. I work a couple of half days a week. Um, I will say that in the early part of the pandemic, um, I was actually furloughed for a couple of months while they were trying to sort out um, how to work everything. Um, I know a lot of the other providers did a lot of telehealth um, and I think that it, it went fairly smoothly. Um, and then when I came back on, most of my patients, probably most of my visits have been in person. Um, we've just been a healthy clinic. So we've had sick patients going to one of our other clinics um, since we have a lot of, um, well, we have multiple clinics and the ability to divide them into sick and healthy and um, trying to keep, um, keep those populations separated. Um, so, you know, I have done a few telehealth visits though. Um, and there were a couple, like recently I saw a kid that, um, well, it was for, I think telehealth is really good for, especially like the behavioral health. Um, so I had parents that, you know, I'd already seen the kid in clinic, but then something came up. And so for a follow-up discussion, it was very convenient for the family to be able to connect via telehealth. So they didn't have to arrange, you know, both parents were able to participate in that discussion and, um, you know, they weren't having to arrange childcare because it was during the after school hours um, and their kids could still be just at the house. Um, so I think there's definitely some, 
some really nice benefits in certain situations of being able to utilize this telehealth. And I know from a patient perspective too, I've had a telehealth visit myself where, you know, I would have had to go to Indianapolis and I went for the initial appointment, I went to Indianapolis, but it was really nice to be able to do the follow-up from my house than not have to drive to Indianapolis to do that. And I feel like, um, you know, I feel like that worked well. And I, I think that it was very appropriate um, use of telehealth for that too, from that personal patient perspective as well. Joyce, do you want to share some personal, any kind of personal stories or anything you've heard from your providers about patient experiences and feedback you guys have received? Yeah, I can. Um, actually, as a, as a provider, I had a couple of patients that they were elderly. I had an elderly couple who um, the, the, they weren't terribly tech savvy, but the wife did have a smartphone. And so they were very, both of them had some significant health problems. The husband has had a, a stroke with um, left hemiparalysis. So he really was uh, very limited in his, in his mobility. And so I had suggested to her, we had, she had came in for a visit or they both had come in for a visit. And I suggested, how about our next visit? We try doing a telehealth visit, um, to see if this is a little bit easier for you to, to get back and forth. And so we talked about it at the beginning or at that visit, she seemed very interested in doing that. So at the, her next appointment or their next appointment, three months later, why I was able to get online with them and they just could not get over it. <laughs> and so we were talking, going over their medications. I was doing a medication reconciliation with them. And I literally was talking with them about their bottle of medicine. And she's like, you know, I'm not sure. So she literally would hold up the bottle so that I could read it off of there. And she said, I'm only taking a half of this. It, you know, and not that she was given permission to do that, but she did that. And so it was a, it was so much nicer to be able to, you know, see exactly what it, especially in their home and what they had, um, how much room he had to maneuver with his wheelchair, just things like that. It, it turned out to be terrific. It was so much easier for her because she has to get him in and out of the wheelchair and, it, they were so pleased with that visit, just absolutely pleased. So even after the pandemic is over, we've been doing every other visit with them, telehealth, because they just feel like they're getting just as good of, of care. Um, again, I'm asking them lots of questions. They're getting right in front of the camera to, so I can assess them. And it, it, it's really turned out, turned out great for that couple especially with their limited um, mobility and transportation. So that's worked out very well for them. Joyce, this is Becky and Sarah, you chime in too. Um, wondering like, have you developed like a, a list of items or um, a list of directions that when you meet with a patient in person and you're preparing them for a telehealth visit to tell them to have available or does someone get on with them early to make sure that they're connected to Zoom well? Yeah, so we, we actually have, we use Cerner, our platform is Cerner and we have our telehealth actually embedded into Cerner. So it's not a, a disconnected type thing. It's, it's completely secured the same way as everything is with Cerner. And so one of our um, medical assistants will call them just the same as if you go into an office and your medical assistant rooms you, they do the same thing uh, via telehealth. So they will room you um, call you, make sure you are, you are connected, make sure that you don't have any connection problems. And then they will ask all the questions and they talk to them. Okay, you know, we're going, Joyce is going to see you, you know, in an hour. Do you have a blood pressure cuff? Could you get yourself weighed? Could you, um, all of these things, do you know how to check a pulse? And so that we can get a set of vitals on them. Um, they also will go ahead and do the uh, medication by history. So they will talk to them 
then they'll tell them even then, if you have any questions about your medicines, why don't you go ahead and get you know, all of your medicines, bring them to your area. So um, in case there's a question, you've got your bottle right there. And um, so they, they do a, a, a rooming the same way that we would in person, it's just done virtual. Wonderful. I, I like the idea of being able to see actually what they're taking because patients often don't bring their medications to a clinic visit. They don't. And even if we ask them to, they often don't. And then a, a standard question I always ask is, you know, what, what do you need refills on so that you don't have to be inconvenienced to call back or the pharmacy doesn't have to, to send us an email or whatever to get your refill. And they will, um, you know, when they have their bottle right there, they're like, oh yeah, this one didn't have any refills on it. So I need this one. So it does make things, uh, um, go very smooth oftentimes. And so uh, that's one of the good benefits of, of telehealth is to have everything right there and seeing the patient in their own environment is, is, is very key to be able to figure out a lot of issues, so. And Sarah, if you wanna talk about even the school-based telehealth, because I know there's people on this call that are interested in doing it and are considering. Sure, you know, sure. Out there that have asked me, so. Yeah, sure. Um, so with, oh, and I've got to remember, it's been a while since I've done. So with like our clinic telehealth, it's all built into, we use Athena and again, similar, um, you know, it's, it's pretty much all built in and um, somebody else sort of gets the patient connected and online. And then when I'm ready to start the visit, I just go into my little office and click start visit and it connects them. And um, so it really is not any extra technical work or anything um, from my end on doing that. Um, with the school telehealth, the way sort of um, that that program has been run is that, um, you know, parents can sign their kids up at the multiple local schools. Um, and of course, they have, you know, all the health history information on file. Um, and so if they end up going in to see the school nurse for something, that she thinks would be good for a provider, one of our, you know, myself, or sometimes there's other providers too, when I'm not available or I'm um, just depending on how the schedule works out. Um, and then we have a different platform and I can't remember the name of the platform. It's been too long, so I'm sorry, but there's a, a different platform that we use um, to connect um, with the school nurse on that. Um, and like I said, she's, so it's video platform, the kids there, she usually has, you know, she, school nurses often talked, sometimes the parent may want to come into the school nurse's office too, to be there during the visit, or the school nurse has obtained some information from the parent um, and the child ahead of time. Of course, we always have a list of the medications, the allergies, any chronic um, medical issues, and then, um, you know, kind of take your history of what the problem is, you know, the ear's been hurting for how long, um, or the sore throat for how long, um, you know, the nurse can get some vitals, of course, um, and then use the equipment with the otoscope um, and the light to, you know, look at the throat, the ears, um, there's also a stethoscope the nurse um, can use, or I have some headphones that connect to that, um, to take a listen, and then, like I said, it's, you um, very nice that the that they can do the rapid straps at least. Um, so for kids, you know, who have a sore throat, and then it, it, the thing that gets a little tricky is then trying to figure out then getting the throat culture done, and that can't be run at the clinic, of course. So then that has to get picked up and delivered um, over to the hospital if they have a negative rapid strap. Um, so um, you know, so there are some limitations, but I think that there are some. Um, really nice things too, especially when you can kind of reassure, you know, again, well, the ear looks okay. It's, you know, at this point in time, it doesn't look infected. You know, they probably have a cold or allergies or earache. Um, and then usually I'll kind of type up some instructions that then the nurse can um, give to the child that goes, it goes to the parents then with kind of what my assessment is and a plan. And, um, you know, we have a pharmacy 
on file for the kids. So if they do need, you know, if they have a positive strep test and they need an antibiotic sent in, um, I can just send that. Um, and yeah, like I said, it, it's a nice service so that um, the parents don't necessarily have to deal with, you know, trying to figure out when they can get the kid into an appointment. Um, and yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Not sure if there's any other questions about that or anything else. Um, Again, if any of you have questions, feel free. Otherwise I'm gonna ask another one and then I'll be about done. We'll let Becky or other people come on. But so we've been very positive about telehealth, but as a provider for both of you, what is one thing that you don't like or that you know you wish would change about telehealth? I mean, I know I'm gonna say, and I'll beat Nicole saying it, reimbursement. I know we're still working through some of that and that's making progress. But um, from your side as a provider, what is a negative um, of telehealth or a hurdle that you've had to overcome? Well, I would say the Far and away, the biggest issue that I have with patients is connectivity. Uh, we have a lot of, even, even, so during the pandemic, especially, I was the one who was responsible for seeing any of the employees that we thought had symptoms and needed to be worked up for COVID. And so even our own employees, you know, didn't necessarily, not everyone had a smartphone, not everyone had good internet service. I mean, we're all rural. And so, there's just not always the best uh, connectivity. I would have patients that were in their car and they would say, um, they try to be connected and they're like, okay, can you give me three minutes? I have no reception right here, but give me three minutes. I'm going to drive up the road and park and I'll talk to you on the phone. And so, or, you know, I'm because then I, I have good reception there. And so I would just wait and then we would connect again in three minutes when they went up the road and then they just sat in their car on the side of the road or in someone else's driveway and we did the visit. So connectivity, I would say, is the biggest problem. There are a lot of things that you can't do with telehealth, but um, or a lot of, you know, maybe diagnoses or a lot of issues that you can't treat over, over telehealth. But at least you could take a, a look at it. How, you know, as, as nurses and as moms and healthcare professionals, how many times has somebody come up to you and said, I don't know, you, I just cut myself. You think I need stitches? And so, you know, we're like, oh, I don't know, maybe, you know, so many people we're, we're all doing that. And so for us to just be able to look at it and say, yeah, you probably need to come in. Or, um, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, and you can take a pretty good look at it and see, or if there's a rash or whatever, you can, you can really get a good look at things, but there are some things that you just can't, can't treat CHF over, over telehealth, but I certainly could assess a person well enough to say, um, you need to come in because this isn't a good platform to do it. And we may need a lot more work than what we're gonna be able to, or I can talk you into or call in for you to, to, to take to fix this. So um, that, is, that is one of the limitations, but at least we can give them a good start. I, I would agree with both of those things. I mean, um, I've been fairly fortunate, but again, I, I haven't done a huge volume, so I haven't had too many issues yet with um, the connection issues, tech stuff, but I can certainly see where that could <laughs> definitely have the potential for it. And I know just personally, having done some visits with my own physician to whatever platform he was using, I can't remember, like I was having issues trying to get video pulled up and we just ended up doing it as an audio visit and it was fine, um, but certainly there can be those technical um, frustrations. Um, and then agree that, um, you know, sorting out what's appropriate to do on telehealth versus what um, really does need to come in as an in-person. Um, but I think that um, I agree that it can be very useful for sort of helping to kind of decide that. Um, and I know, um, you know, a lot of different, con being connected with a lot of different pediatricians and things, um, you know, they have found that it's very useful to do a quick telehealth call for all the myriad concerns that 
parents will have. And, you know, if you're going to spend the five to 10 minutes on the phone with them, you know, now that I know a lot of pediatricians office too are like, well, this is great because you can actually get reimbursed now for things that previously you've spent, you know, offering out free advice. Um, and, you know, a lot of, you know, sometimes you can write, just do a quick telehealth visit as kind of a reassurance to the parent, or like you said, you know, discuss it for a few minutes and then be like, yeah, you know, this really is probably something that we need to actually, you know, you need to bring the kid in so we can get a good exam and, um, and determine what to do and where to go from here. So. Becky, do you have any questions that have came in or we'll open the lines up if anybody has any questions or want additional information. We have Nicole, Joyce and Sarah, three experts from all with different points of view. So this is your chance to, to ask all those questions. The one question that did come in was what challenges have you faced with reimbursement for telehealth? Well, from our aspect, it's it, it's really just the reimbursement cost itself. So, you know, we if we we would be providing that same service, maybe with a little bit of, um, you know, physical differences, but you know, we're getting less reimbursement from having them do a telehealth visit, and so it it makes it. A disadvantage to to encourage patients to use telehealth because we're going to get reimbursed less. So that's really been the the challenge I would say with us. Um, if the patient wants that, we still do it. We just we just do whatever we have to do for the best for the patient. But um, just the reimbursement um, itself is is not as as high as it would be if we would have the patient come in. Sarah, any issues that you've had with reimbursement? Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not really involved in that whole aspect of things. <laughs> I just put my codes in and <laughs> close my visits. So sorry that I don't have too much to add um, from my perspective on that. No problem. That was my last question that had come in to this point in time, Elizabeth. All right, well, jump in if you have anything, but I really want to thank Joyce and Sarah for their time, as well as Nicole. Um, we appreciate it, and we encourage any of you to start or expand um, telehealth. Again, Becky, I think we'll be sending out the recording is that correct, Becky? You'll have a yeah. link to the recording and the presentation. Um, and if you need to get in contact with Joyce or Sarah, I can help connect you or can help filter those questions. And we just wanna say thanks to Rush and Memorial Hospital and Greene County General Hospital for always being very participatory in the programs with IRHA, with Valiant Health and MBQIP and with all the programs that the Indiana State Office of Rural Health offers. And I'm going to call out David. We do have David Conrad back. He's out of the call center, the depths of the COVID-19 call center. So many of you know him. He's our funder with the FLEX program and Joyce Fillenworth with State Office of Rural Health. I don't think Joyce could make it today, um, but many of you know her and you can always reach out to them as well. So thanks everybody. Becky, do you have anything else to add? I'll let you wrap it up. No, that, that pretty well wraps things up. If you're working on your program and you want to work on things running more smoothly or just see how others um, are running their programs, connect with us and we'll have you network or we will um, share best practices, definitely link you up with Nicole, but we wanna make sure that you're maximizing your reimbursement and your patients feel very comfortable with telehealth visits and it's definitely a wave of the future. So more to come and let us know what other types of uh, issues or questions that you have so that we can um, pull together and have individuals share that have really mastered that particular problem. So have a wonderful day, continue to stay safe and we really appreciate everything you all do for the patients in Indiana. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.